you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa and welcome to Threshold of Hope, a program where we bring you the writings from the church, the official writings of the church. Today is the Feast of the Guardian Angels, by the way, and this is a celebration for all of us. Jesus Christ, our Lord, promised in the Gospel of St. Matthew that every single one of us has a guardian angel. And so does every bad guy and every good guy and all the in-between guys and gals, everybody in between. So that it, you know, I, I remember certainly uh, as we were moving, unfortunately, towards war in Iraq, it was a tough war, I kept praying for the guardian angel of uh, Saddam Hussein. And he had one too. Uh, Osama bin Laden had one. Everybody has a guardian angel. And so it's good for us to try to follow the leadings of our own guardian angel, but also pray for the guardian angels of some of the people who might be some troublemakers. And maybe they'll follow their inspirations and be able to do stuff that's good. That's a good thing. And one thing I also want to do uh, is give a thanks to uh, Susie and Chad Eckberg out in Gillette, Wyoming. They invited me to come out to their parish, St. Matthew's in Gillette, uh, and their pastor, Father Cliff Jacobson, and his associate, Father Raymond, were great and arranged for me to be able to get out on a cattle drive. I uh, didn't get too much time off, but we got out there and uh, drove some cattle that had been wandering away. Uh, brought him over to water, and that was just a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So, you know, just some things that, uh, and by the way, if you notice, I'm still wearing my clerics, <laughs> but it's uh, uh, my, my camouflage care. I didn't want the cattle to see me. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's a good friend of mine, uh, Ray King, who also went with me, and we all both got to ride. All right. Uh, thanks. To, uh, one, can't forget Zeke, um, the man who owns the cattle and the horses, and let us get uh, on that ride. Okay. Uh, and by the way, don't don't get me wrong. Um, I was still out there rounding up sinners a lot more longer than I rounded up cattle. Uh, I spent most of my time doing that, but uh, I thought it was just good to keep practice in both areas uh, so I can. Learn from one to the other. All right, uh, we're going to take a look at the Pope's document, Verbum Domini. Uh, you can get a paperback copy of it from EWTN's religious catalog. All you have to do is call 1 800 854 6316, or you can also go to the website, EWTN Religious Catalog.com. If you would rather, you can also download a free electronic copy of Verbum Domini. It's in the document library of our website under the Faith tab. And just go to EWTN, click the Faith tab, you'll see the document, and type in uh, Verbum Domini. Also, while you're there, uh, you can watch uh, uh, some of the live shows and past shows from this program. Uh, just click on where it says EWTN Live Shows, and then click on Threshold of Hope. You take a look at it. Also, I uh, want you to get involved and participate in our show today. One, you can do like all these nice people have done and come from Vermont and Texas and all sorts of other, Missouri, other places, uh, and be part of our studio audience and ask questions. In other ways, you can send us emails um, by, at, by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or you can also call us on the live program, which is live on Tuesdays at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number is 1-800-221-9460. Or you can also call 205-271-2980. All right, we are still in paragraph 56 of this document. And uh, this, is, this is where the Pope is describing the sacramentality of the Word. How the Word is not purely spiritual. Words are spoken 
and oftentimes written down. That's some, both of those are physical realities, pen and paper or the, the sound waves. And so this, in that sense, the word of God is also an outward sign instituted by God. Okay? And we can take a look uh, and make an analogy about that in terms of the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament under the appearances of the consecrated bread and wine. Uh, we see that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1373, where it says, and I quote, Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, is present in many ways to his church, in his word of scripture, in his church's prayer. He said, whatever two or three are gathered in my name, that I'll be there in the midst. He is present in the poor, because the sick and the imprisoned. Whatever you do to them, you do to Christ. And uh, in the sacraments of which he is the author. In the sacrifice of the mass, he's present in the person of the minister. Matter of fact, Vatican II says, the priest acts in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. But he is present most especially in the Eucharistic species, right? So that's very much present there. Also, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, 1374, says that the mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharistic species is unique. This presence is called real, the real presence of Christ in the sacrament by which is not intended to exclude the other types of presence as if they could not be real too, but because it is presence in the fullest sense. That is to say, it is a substantial presence. So the substance of the person of Jesus Christ is present in the Eucharist, by which Christ, God and man, makes himself holy and entirely present. So that's our faith on the Eucharist. And when we approach the altar and partake in the Eucharistic banquet, we truly share in the body and blood of Christ. So um, I had one gentleman who says, I, you know, I can't accept your Catholic teaching because uh, when Jesus says, this is my body, he just meant that it's a symbol. And I said, no, it says the word is. You know, that, it doesn't say, is a symbol of, does it? It says the word, is my body. This is the cup of my blood. Not, it is symbolic of. And then I said, it's no wonder that Billy Clinton boy had trouble understanding the word is when he was on trial. If you give him that kind of confusion, you know, he can understand it. All right, so the proclamation of God's word at the celebration of Mass entails an acknowledgement that Christ himself is present, that he speaks to us, and that he wishes to be heard. Now again, we go back to Vatican II in the document on the liturgy, which is called Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraph 7, it says, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present in his word, since it is he himself who speaks when the Holy Scriptures are read in the church. That's, it's not just a philosophy book. I've, I've mentioned that many times as we've gone through this document, that scripture is not philosophy. It is God's word, and it's not something to be played with. I, well, I'm hearing all kinds of ways people are trying to dance around, uh, for instance, the issue of same-sex marriage. Say, so, well, the Bible also says that uh, in the Old Testament that you couldn't eat uh, lobster or shellfish. So, you know, uh, if, if, then it changed. So, so if that can change, so can marriage. Well, let's just hold, pull up the reins on that horse and keep in mind that, you know, it was Christ who said that all foods are now clean in Mark chapter 7. 
And then St. Peter had a vision of all unclean foods. You probably saw a little bit of lobster bisque or something in there. And that you can eat them. You can eat shellfish. And so that was by a specific revelation directly from Christ. And then through St. Peter, again confirmed in Acts chapter 10. However, the idea of marriage never changed. Marriage is oriented towards the conception and raising of children, as well as the love of man and woman. And that hasn't changed. You can't change that. Uh, I know that there's some feminists who want to promote cloning because their goal is to make men obsolete. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Look, if we haven't made the horse obsolete and rounding up cattle, you're not going to make men obsolete and giving birth to babies. Sorry, ladies. So, you know, that's just not the way it's going to be. Now, St. Jerome, who was, we had his feast day. It would have been on Sunday, but of course Sunday preempted it. But St. Jerome is the patron saint of scripture scholars. And he said uh, that we ought to, how we ought to approach both the Eucharist and the scriptures. In his commentary on Psalm 147, it's called In Psalm 147, St. Jerome wrote, We are reading the sacred scriptures. For me, the gospel is the body of Christ. For me, the holy scriptures are his teaching. And when he says, Whoever does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, even though these words can also be understood of the Eucharistic mystery, Christ's body and blood are really the word of Scripture, God's teaching. So he, he sees that very close link between the Eucharist and Scripture. And he continues on that um, when we approach the Eucharistic mystery, it, if a crumb of the Eucharist falls to the ground, we are troubled. We don't want any of it to fall to the ground. That was, uh, some of you may have remembered, uh, there were some churches that were making their own Eucharistic bread, and the crumbs were falling everywhere. And people just acted as if you go pick it up with a vacuum cleaner or something. You know, that's not right. But we, back in the early church, they knew faith in the real presence of Christ. It is his body. So if a crumb fell to the ground, they were troubled. Yet, when we are listening to the Word of God and God's Word and Christ's flesh and blood are being poured into our ears, yet we pay no heed. What great peril should we not feel? In other words, when the Scripture is being read during Holy Mass, it is not time to tune out. That is not the time to tune out. It is time to give ear. That should be given the greatest respect of being the Word of God that is meant to direct who we are and where we're going. And so that's a very important element. Christ is truly present under the species of bread and wine and is analogously present in the Word proclaimed in the liturgy. A deeper understanding of the sacramentality of God's Word can thus lead us to a more unified understanding of the mystery of Revelation, which takes place through deeds and words intimately connected. Again, De Verbum from Vatican II, the document on Revelation, says in paragraph 2 that this plan, God's plan of Revelation, is realized by deeds and words having an inner unity. You know, don't you all like it when somebody talks a good talk, but walks the good walk with it? Isn't that what we look for in somebody? That there is consistency and integrity between what you say and what you do. And that's what we all aim to do. I mean, all of us fall short on that, but you know, we aim to have the actions and words go together. 
The same is true in the Eucharist and in our faith. That the actions and words having an inner unity, the deeds wrought by God in the history of salvation, manifest and confirm the teaching and realities signified by the words, while the words proclaim the deeds and clarify the mystery contained in them. So, for instance, the prophets said, like Jeremiah and the other prophets, that unless the people of Israel repents, the Lord will let the Babylonians destroy Jerusalem. What happened? They repented for a while, and then Babylonians went away. So they said, okay, we take it back. Let's go back to the sins. And they went right back to the sins. And Jeremiah said, that's it. It's done. You will not stay repentant. You will get destroyed. And then in 587, it happened exactly as he said. So that the word was connected to the action. And then he said, but I will bring you back. And uh, other prophets like Ezekiel and part, Isaiah 40 to 55 said they'd come back. And what happened in 539? They came back. So that that's the kind of link between God's word and action. Same with Jesus Christ. He said, the Son of Man will be handed over to men and will be tortured, crucified, buried, and then on the third day will rise again. And what happened? When he got to Jerusalem, he was tortured, crucified, buried, and then rose again. So the link between his words and actions is very clear. And this is what we also want to see going on in the Eucharist. When I say at Mass, as a priest, this is my body, the Word of Christ makes that action happen. And so there's that link, by, and again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, working in Scripture and in my actions. So this is going to be uh, uh, something that we need to learn to appreciate uh, to benefit the spiritual life of the faithful and the church's activity, that is pastoral activity. Now, paragraph 57, which is sacred scripture and the lectionary. I got a great email from a man in the Philippines who's wondering about some of this and, and the lectionary. So this is a good paragraph to talk about that. That the synod wanted us to pay attention to aspects of the celebration of the liturgy and the service of the word. Again, every sacrament in the normal condition, I mean, there are emergency situations like emergency baptisms and things like that, where you might skip the, uh, a lot of the prayers and just get down to baptizing because the person is dying. But that's unusual. That's unusual. In the normal liturgy, there's always a service of the word. And so in the first place, the Pope wants to emphasize the importance of the lectionary. Now, there's a few of you here in the studio audience um, and a few of you watching who remember before Vatican II, we had the same readings every year. There was one cycle. Most of the readings were from the Gospel of Matthew. And we just had that one cycle a year. And some of the Eastern churches still do that. And Vatican II... Uh, called for uh, a, a, a change that has borne much fruit by giving us a richer access to the sacred scripture, which is now offered in abundance, especially on Sundays. So we have Old Testament reading, Psalm, New Testament reading, Alleluia verse, and Gospel. So there's, you know, there's a lot there. And this is something that was brought up in Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on Liturgy. Uh, the first document of Vatican II that came out in 1962, and it says in paragraph 107, that the liturgical year is to be revised so that the traditional customs and discipline of the sacred seasons shall be preserved or restored to suit the conditions of modern times. The minds of the faithful 
must be directed primarily toward the feasts of the Lord Jesus, whereby the mysteries of salvation are celebrated in the course of the year. So that the, the linchpins of celebration are, of course, Christmas and Easter. Those are the two main points. And then uh, you orient Advent towards it and the post-Christmas season towards it. Then Easter, Lent is oriented toward it, and then the Easter season. And then, of course, we have the ordinary uh, time in which we go through various other things, but make sure we cover the feasts of the Lord. The present structure of the lectionary that we have since Vatican II not only presents the more important texts of Scripture with some frequency, but also helps us understand the unity of God's plan, how Old and New Testament are part of a single plan. There's not discontinuity, but there is continuity. And you see that in the old interplay between Old Testament and New Testament readings. When you go to church on Sunday, pay attention to how the Old Testament reading relates to the gospel reading. That's the main link you look for. The reading from the uh, epistle it, you know, follows the, the, that epistle. So uh, we'll go, right now we're going through the letter of James, and we'll go through the whole letter of James. Then we'll take another epistle of Paul or Peter and so on, and we'll go through that whole epistle. But the first reading and the gospel are linked, showing the Old Testament prophecy and Jesus fulfilling it in the New Testament. That's the main way they are chosen. And this shows an interplay, as he, as he says, in which Christ is the central figure, commemorated in his Paschal mystery. Jesus Christ unifies Old and New Testaments in those readings. Any remaining difficulties in seeing this relationship between those readings should be approached in the light of canonical interpretation. Now, canonical interpretation is an approach that Pope Benedict really likes. It uh, was thought of by Bernard Anderson, a great uh, Old Testament scholar. And he want, you know, one of the problems with Old Testament scholarship sometimes, and New Testament, is that we tend to dissect the texts. Now, <clears throat> if you are in a biology class and you dissect a frog, you learn a lot about frogs, don't you? But one thing you're not going to learn <clears throat> from that frog anymore is about croaking. It already croaked, and you're not going to hear it do it again. You need the whole frog to hear a croak, right? And the same thing with the Bible. It's, you learn a lot by taking it into its parts, the words and passages and all that. But you need to see the whole. And that's why Bernard Anderson and Pope Benedict certainly liked this a lot, you know, talked about looking at the whole canon of Scripture. Okay? Now, Bernard Anderson had a problem in, in his book on canonical uh, interpretation because which canon are you going to use? And he just opted for the 1627 uh, canon of the King James Bible, which excluded seven books. He admitted that the 1611 version had those seven books. He said, ah, I can't choose. It went back and forth, so I'll just go with 1627. Well, that was kind of arbitrary. We Catholics use all the books that had been recognized as canonical from the early church so that we have 73 books and you get more for your Catholic dollar. <laughs> All right, so um, this, uh, we look at the Bible and the unity of the Bible as a whole, and that various folks can do publications that bring out the interconnection of the le lectionary re readings. Some things are online, you can look there, and there are books and weekly uh, uh, services that help to show the link between the two Testaments. But all the readings must be proclaimed in the liturgy. The priest doesn't have the authority to eliminate any, nor does anybody else. Um, proclaim everybody for the liturgy of the day. 
Any other problems you bring to the Congregation for Divine Worship? Um, you know, the Vatican Office for Worship. And he also mentions that the current lectionary of the Latin Rite has ecumenical significance. Why? Because a number of other Christian denominations are using the same lectionary readings. Many Episcopalians and Methodists and Lutherans and others use our, the same lectionary. They work together on that. So there would be uh, uh, some similarity in that we would be reading the Gospels together. Now again, they usually eliminate the deuterocanonical books. We have them sometimes, but, and they usually don't. But otherwise, there, there is a very important ecumenical link between them. And then there's a, and it brings up, there's a slightly different issue with the Eastern churches. So for instance, um, I help out at the local Maronite parish, and we also have just a one year lectionary cycle. Right? We don't have three years, we have one year. Um, and the other Eastern churches uh, have one year ones too. But this, they also have to be alert to the ecumenical issues <clears throat> because the Byzantine rites, you know, often have the same lectionary cycle as the Orthodox communities. And the Syriac Catholics and Syriac uh, Orthodox have the same readings, and the Chaldeans and the Syrian uh, Orthodox have the same. So he, he, he's not saying change it right away, but if you do change it, you know, use your own official uh, means of doing that through a synod of your right, and go ahead and do that uh, according to the proper law, sur um, uh, of the church. And again, always being alert to the ecumenical context. So, you know, this is, um, you know, the, the, the s how the sacred lit uh, scripture and the lectionary work out. Now, I think it's probably about time for us to take a break. Why don't we uh, go over to a break now and we'll come back next week to do paragraph 58. And we want to come back and get your questions and comments, emails, our studio audience, and we've also got a special call in coming up today, so please stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, we have a nice group of folks here from different parts of the country. We'd love to have you come and join us too. If you can make it uh, here on pilgrimage, contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And also speaking of pilgrimages, I'll be leading a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, God willing, on uh, December 15th to the 26th. And uh, we we're planning on spending uh, the 24th uh, in Bethlehem. So that Christmas Eve will be pretty much all day in Bethlehem. Uh, and if you can make it, I'll give you a phone number. It's one 800 5 Five, four, four, five, five, six. Or if you go online, it's, you go to my website, www.fathermitchpacwa.org, and Father is spelled out. Now again, before we get to our questions, I want to let you know a little bit about the World Synod of Bishops, which is going to begin in Rome this coming Sunday. And it will last for about three weeks, concluding on October 28th. And right now we have joining us by phone uh, to tell us a little bit more about the Synod is someone who will be there as part of the American contingent of seven U.S. bishops 
and nine other Americans serving as official experts or observers. Now, a lot of you already know him if you're a part of our EWTN family. He's the president of Renewal Ministries and the host of our program, Choices We Face, Mr. Ralph Martin. Hello, Ralph. Hey, Father Mitch. Good to hear your voice. Good to hear yours, too. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Good, sir. Good. I'm scrambling to get ready to leave for Rome the day after tomorrow. All right. Now eat some pasta for me while you're out there. Okay. <laughs> so um, tell us a little, just to let folks know a little bit, what is a synod? Well, after Vatican II, um, the bishops decided and Pope Paul VI implemented the practice of regular consultation with representatives of bishops from around the world on issues important to the church. And so uh, I think this is the 13th uh, synod of bishops we've had since Vatican mm -hmm. II. And this one, of course, is focused on the new evangelization. And what it is, is a, it's a serious attempt to hear from bishops around the world their take on important issues, in this case, the new evangelization. And then at the end of the synod, uh, the synod fathers uh, vote on certain propositions they present to the pope and ask him to consider in uh, publishing a post-synodal apostolic exhortation on new evangelization. So uh, this is my first synod, and I've gotten a lot, of, a lot of information about what the role of an expert is, and it's a pretty comprehensive, uh, complex process, and uh, it looks like I'll be pretty busy, but I'm really looking forward to it, too, because this is such an important topic. Yeah, well, you might not get as much pasta as I thought you would. <laughs> yeah. They do take a good long lunch break in the middle of the day, but they come back to work till 7 o'clock at night. All right. Good. Well, I'm sure they'll take good care of you there. Now, um, uh, you are going there as one of the experts because of all the work that you have done in evangelization around the world, right? I think that's definitely one, one factor. And also, I'm director of our graduate theology programs in the New Evangelization at Sacred Heart mm -hmm. Seminary in Detroit, oh, where we grant a pontifical license in theology uh, in New Evangelization. So I think that's a factor. And sure. Another factor, I think, is I did my doctoral dissertation in Rome last year on, on a topic related to the New Evangelization, trying to address some of the doctoral confusion. And it just got published about a month ago. And, uh, oh, congratulations. Number, uh, a number of cardinals and bishops gave very strong endorsements, including Cardinal Dolan and Cardinal Whirl and Cardinal George and people like that. So I think all of those things together kind of maybe contributed to it. But of course, it's the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know. You know really. oh, yeah. Well, I want to make sure that you send me a copy of that new book so that we can have you on our show. Okay. And discuss not only uh, that book, but also your work in the Senate. That'd be great. Thank you much, Ralph. Okay. And just want to let you all know that EW10 will carry the opening mass of the Synod. It'll be live that we carry it. It'll be on Sunday, October 7th at 3.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And then it'll re-air uh, when you wake up at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, <laughs> about to almost 11 and a half hours later. So uh, we'd love to, to have you come. All right. Now let's go over to our studio audience, and we have a question from our studio on, Sir, where are you from? Chicago. It's great, great to be here, Father, because we represent Chicago in a, in a big way, and we're happy to be at the Threshold of It's great to have Sir, Chicagoans over here. Uh, and what's your question? My question is, is there a, an Old Testament basis for our understanding as Catholics concerning guardian angels? You know, what you see in the Old Testament is a series of individual episodes where angels guided people and led them, okay? So uh, uh, angels appeared to Abraham before the uh, time that he and Sarah conceived Isaac. Uh, there were also uh, angels uh, that uh, appeared, for instance, uh, Balaam was trying to go through a place and his donkey kept stopping and he kept beating the donkey, and the donkey said, why are you beating me? There's an angel right there in front of you trying to stop me. Can't you see him? <laughs> and you know which one had more sense. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then you see uh, a few other, the, the mother of Samson, and then mo very famously we celebrated the feast the other day of um, the, guard, the, the three archangels, and Raphael guided uh, to, Tobiah, 
on his uh, way to see his relative Raguel. So you see occasions, but Christ is the first one who pulled that all together and said, everybody has a guardian angel. We just, the Old Testament just showed some of the examples. This is something for everybody. All right? All right. We have a call. Hello, Connie? Yes. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Missouri. And your question? Uh, my question is, I've got a friend who insists that everything is already in God's plan. It's preordained. Mm -hmm. And everything that's happening cannot be changed, no matter how many prayers, rosaries, novenas, or anything. It's mm -hmm. already said. And mm -hmm. that he says, he quotes, you know, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, not changing God's mind or plan. Well, now let's think that through. You know, uh, there are a, a number of situations where God certainly, and this is very much uh, an important point, God knows what we call the future, all right? Now, this is, is a little bit complicated, but I'm going to try to explain it. You have to keep in mind that God does not know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what happened in the past because he doesn't have a future or a past. For, so, um, I, I <clears throat> take an example. I've got my Bible here, right? And the whole story from Adam to the end of the world is written down here in my hands. And I've got that whole story right here in one piece, right? But if you are one of the characters inside the Bible, it takes you your whole life to go through your whole life. But God, as the author, has everything at one moment present to him. Like the beginning to the end, creation to the end of the world is all present at kind of in one moment, and this, this, this image is rough, but it, like kind of in one moment, the whole of history from creation to the end times is present right here. And so God doesn't know the future. It's rather that the future is, what we call the future is already now to God. And what we call the past, because we lose it, we're, we are finite, limited creatures. We lose our past. Some of us would like to lose more of it than we, than we have. But we, we, we generally lose our past, right? And uh, we call, you know, the, for instance, the crucifixion of Christ something in the past. But in Christ's divine nature, in God's divine nature, it is not past. The crucifixion is as much now as it ever was. That's one of the reasons why we have crucifixes in our church. Some people say, oh, you can't have a crucifix because that's all over. And no, it's not. It's still present in God. And it's also why at Mass, see, this, this is a very, very important concept to understand about God's nature. The reason that we say at Mass that Mass is the representation of Christ's death on the cross. Some people from outside the church oftentimes try to say, oh, you Catholics claim to be crucifying Jesus over and over again. And Jesus said he died once and for all. And in fact, the Catholic Church, of course, believes those lines in the letter to the Hebrews, Christ died once and for all. And we don't say that we're crucifying him another time, but rather the eternity of that moment of the crucifixion is made present to us right now. Now, in this, instead of seeing that we are, and see, this is where your friend's problem is. He's still thinking that God knows what's going to happen in the future and that he's going to move all the chess pieces to make the queen fall. 
or to capture the king, to capture the rook or whatever it might be. And that he's looking upon history as if it were chess pieces instead of seeing it as the ongoing relationship. So yes, what is happening in the future is already present to God, but it is still we who are interacting in that relationship with God and that we have authentic free will. And what you have to keep now now your friend your friend could be a muslim because in islam they say that it is already preordained and cannot be undone that is true islam that you know if something bad happens to you then god willed it and that's why uh, throughout the quran and in everyday speech among uh, muslims uh, is, everything is inshallah god willing right so they, they have but as Christians, we believe that God did create us with free will. For that reason, Moses said in Deuteronomy 30, choose the right or choose the evil. Make your choice. Choose life or choose death. Make your choice. And that we are interacting with God in that, and he is giving us his grace to help us interact with him, but we also have to be open to that grace. We have a free will, and, we, and, and then he will judge us, as he says over and over again, on the basis of our decisions to believe in him or not, to accept what he does. Again, because even the devils believe in God, as St. James said, and they tremble. So it's not enough to believe in God, also to do what he says. So, uh, as he says, St. James says, be doers of the word. This is our call. And your friend will not be able to get away with not taking responsibility for his actions just by saying that, well, God's already preordained and I can't do anything about it. The heck you can't. I, I will never forget a couple coming just to talk to me casually. They said, well, I know we're committing adultery, but God willed it. Not according to my Ten Commandments, he didn't. Mm -mm. My Ten Commandments said you shall not commit adultery, and he knew that you had that choice. You have that choice, and he didn't make you do it. So don't buy that kind of stuff. That's, uh, it's, it's very much important to keep in mind that we have a responsibility too. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Um, I'm Wayne, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Great. I'm here with my wife, Miriam, who is originally from Mexico. Yep. And our niece, Deanna, who is from Toluca, Mexico. Are you going to introduce your whole group, or are you going to ask a question? Okay, I'm going to ask my question. Sorry. Um, we're Respect Life coordinators in our parish, and we run into this all the time. People who are regularly going to Mass, pray the rosary, you do hours of adoration, mm -hmm. but use artificial birth control and in many cases are in marriages not sanctioned by the church. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we talk to them about how Christ speaks through his church? Sure. Good question. You know, this, um, these issues and a number of other issues that we see in our, our culture today are heavily driven by various issues of human sexuality. And people insist that they want complete autonomy. How I feel about it is the way my conscience is formed. Because, of course, in the, the area of human sexuality, there are a lot of emotions and feelings. And they don't want to deny their feelings. i got to be true to myself. Well, yeah, you got to be true to yourself. But you also have to be true to your God. Well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Good. Listen to what God has to say and then do it. Ask for the grace to do it. Now, when it comes to these specific issues, we have to, you know, there are a number of ways that you help people deal with. When you are doing questions about human freedom and conscience, you always have to ask questions about what is the goal and 
how prudent is your action? See? And with you know, something like uh, you know, birth regulation, that uh, you know, people use contraception because they don't want to have children. Now, what has been the result? And being a pro-life coordinator, you probably know these things better than I. But as many people need to be reminded that uh, 1970 or so was the year in which the contraception pill became readily available. It had gone through its testing and was approved by the FDA and became readily available, right? And then just three years later, you had the decision by the Supreme Court uh, to, to recognize they were ignorant about when life really begins. So they said, once it's outside the womb, it's a human being, but we don't know about inside the womb. So instead of erring towards safety, they said, uh, you can have an abortion, okay? Because we don't know that it's human, we can't prove that. Now today we can better, but uh, that's why I have to come back to the Supreme Court on that principle. But take a look at the results. Once contraception and abortion were approved and readily available in the country, People said it is okay to risk taking a lot of sexual experience and people engaged in wide varieties of sexual experience, much more so than before, right? So again, this is a prudential issue. Since 1970, what has happened to the rate of the birth of children to unwed mothers? especially teenagers, what has happened in terms of the spread of sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, then, of course, the increase of abortions. So what we've had is that people said, oh, it's worth the risk. But what happened is now 20% of the population is infected. Back be right before 1970, in the 1960s, there were two sexually transmitted diseases. Today there are 40, a number of which are not curable. And, uh, and, and some, pop, some parts of our population, 70% have STDs. And in some parts of our population, the African American community, for instance, 72% are children born to unwed mothers, 53% of Hispanics, 40% nationwide. So, prudentially, has this been a good decision? Has this led to greater stability in our society? Survey says no. No. So this is, so that's prudential. And then you look at the purpose of human sexuality. Is it uh, the way Hollywood portrays it, where people are walking playgrounds? Or are people individuals with their own inherent dignity that must be respected with commitments to them for all that's entailed, not only with the birth of children, but for the various other issues of economic, spiritual, and emotional responsibilities. The responsibility part, part is forgotten. They don't care about that. They care more about, you know, walking playgrounds. And so we need to give them this information to say, are you being prudent? No, you're not. And also, has it reduced, if you remember back in 68, when people argued against Pope Paul VI, if you don't have birth control readily available, people will get divorces. What happened? The divorce rate went up, especially among people who use contraception, whereas the uh, people who use natural family planning have a divorce rate of 2%. It's way down from the national average. So you look at the practical, prudential issues of what is right and wrong, and you see that they don't have good sense. We need to let them know that and, let them, and speak to them clearly about these issues.
I recommend, I've been recommending to a lot of people, a great book you can get it off the internet for free. It's by Dr. Richard Wetzel. And it is called Sexual Wisdom. And it just deals with a wide variety of issues that we need just to let people know the facts of life and not the myths of Hollywood. This, you know, when it comes to human sexuality, and that, you know, you, matter of fact, my general impression, I don't want to live like those people in Hollywood. I was on the plane coming back from Wyoming yesterday, and people are, there's one lady in this seat across from me, kept looking at all these scandals by these people, says, do you want your sins written up in People Magazine or one of these other things? Do you want that talked about? I don't. You know, that's why I go to confession. He can't say a word when, I'm, when he's done. You know, um, so we don't want to follow the foolishness of Hollywood, but the wisdom of Christ in his church. And that's what we want to tell him. All right. I have another studio question. Uh, yes, ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Missouri. Good to have you. And uh, I would like for you to clarify for me about the Holy Family and Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time we hear about that is during the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And then when you read St. Luke's Gospel, he states that after the presentation of the Christ child in the temple, the family returns to Nazareth. Right. So could you clarify that sure. for me? You know, it's a very important kind of principle, not only in that one episode, but throughout the Gospels, that you'll see the evangelists are telling the story as if through a telescope. With a telescope, you can make it longer or shorter, right? And you get a longer distance view and a shorter distance view. So for instance, in the story of the multiplication of loaves and fish, most of the evangelists tell that in about seven verses. St. John tells it in 72 verses. So he lengthened it out. The, uh, most of the evangelists have part of a chapter about the Last Supper. St. John has five chapters. But then he doesn't mention the baptism at all. So there are a number of these situations where evangelists telescope out or shorten up, okay? And this is uh, something that's going on here. Both Matthew, who mentions the flight into Egypt, and Luke, who does not, with the infancy narrative, both and have Christ and the Holy Family ending up in Nazareth. St. Luke telescopes down, and St. Matthew telescopes that one aspect, but no mention of the presentation in the temple. He telescopes that down. So, you know, for, uh, and, and there are a couple possibilities. Uh, one is they may not have had each other's sources. They both, you know, St. Luke mentions he used various sources. And his source is clear in, in Luke 1 and 2 about the infancy narratives. That is clearly a translation into Greek from an Aramaic original. All right? You see a lot of Aramaic sentence structures being translated. It's, it's funny Greek, but translates well back into Aramaic. Um, and St. Matthew has his materials that he focuses on. And uh, I know, I, you know, some, some of my colleagues in Scripture scholarship uh, suspect that St. Matthew may not have been the actual author. I think he was. You know why? Remember, what, what was St. Matthew's uh, career? Tax collector. Tax collector, right? And he organizes his gospel as if it were a ledger. You got your Sermon on the Mount column, then you got your miracles section, then you got your mission section, then you got your um, parables section. All the parables in one place. You know, and he does, so, uh, and so he's got his own organization, while Luke has the same material that he organizes throughout. So it's different ways of organizing, but they present this, and we see that they balance each other out. Okay? All right. We've run out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and let your guardian angels protect you in every way you go. And again, this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible with your donations. 
So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we will be able to pay our bills. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you.